Unlike our favorite one-hour television dramas, solving crimes in real life is a lot more complicated with many more obstacles. For instance, according to the Murder Accountability Project, in 2018, the rate for clearing murder cases in California was 58.41%, meaning that more than 40% of all murder cases went unsolved. Each of these murder cases presents its own challenges to detectives, and for cold cases, that includes time. But what happens when one of the obstacles to clearing a case is the identity of the victim? In this episode of California True Crime, we cover a case in Long Beach, California that took decades for detectives to solve. But when they finally find the person responsible, one big question remains. Who is the victim? This is the case of Long Beach Jane Doe number 40. Welcome to California True Crime. I'm Jessica, and with me for this episode is Charles. How are you? I'm doing good. In this episode, we'll be sharing the details of a horrific murder in Long Beach, California in 1974. The majority of information for this episode came from the newspaper in Long Beach called The Press Telegram. And if you're interested in more information on this episode or any of our episodes, as well as the full list of our citations, you can find that on our website at CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. About 25 miles south of Los Angeles sits Long Beach, California. With the Pacific Ocean as its backyard and five-plus miles of Sandy Beach as its border, Long Beach is reminiscent of the stereotypical California town you might see on TV, kind of the town we've talked about, I think, several times now, the one we sort of, sort of try not to talk too much about, but this is that typical beach. Yeah, I think that when, especially now, people say Long Beach, California, that's, that is the stereotypical California image for, I think, people that don't live here. You can see citizens and tourists alike riding their bikes through the streets. Lots of them are lined with palm trees and people spending kind of sunny days out on the beach. Built by migration from America's Midwest, shaped by the discovery of oil and factories like the Henry Ford Corporation, the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, and a naval shipyard, as well as the events of World War II and the internment of the Japanese. Over the years, the population of Long Beach has exploded. It's actually the seventh largest city in California, according to the World Atlas. Long Beach is also affected by its location. It's just 45 minutes from Los Angeles and two hours from the California-Mexico border. And this is a busy town with a very diverse population. Yeah, I, I don't often think of Long Beach being that close to the border. I, I, you know, obviously San Diego has a big influence from our, our southern border. and. But I, I I forget a lot of times that that is that it would be one of those towns that is a major thoroughfare from big like a big city like L A. and then having that amount of commercial and people traffic back and forth. Yeah, and in the 1970s when this happens, Long Beach is already a bustling city of about 358 thousand people, and despite being one of the largest cities in California, it's often described in a lot of the stuff that I researched as being a place that's retained a really small town feel. Hmm. And the southern part of Long Beach is three and a half miles of coastline known as Alamitos Beach. This area is integral to the crime I'm going to cover, and the physical boundaries of the beach are Alamitos Avenue on the west, Junipero Avenue on the east, 4th Street in the north, and the Pacific Ocean as its southern boundary. And of course, we'll have a map of this up on our site so you can get a better idea of where it happened. The beach, and in particular the western part of the beach, is very close to some of Long Beach's more famous attractions. Just across the water from the beach sits the RMS Queen Mary. That's a retired British ocean liner that traveled from 1936 to 1967. And in 1967, that ship docked in Long Beach and became a huge part of Long Beach history, as well as a huge tourist attraction. Yeah, actually my aunt and uncle went... Uh, for a trip years when like, I was a little kid and, and brought back like a postcard souvenir from it. Yeah, I know. I've never seen the RMS Queen Mary, but I know all my friends in LA, everybody has that, the t-shirt because everybody, it's mm-hmm. just a, it's a really big attraction that people go. It's common for people in California, especially to have seen it. 
Alamitos Beach is very near another really important part of Long Beach history. In 2021, this area is actually just a set of, well, not just, but a set of shopping outlets and a convention center. But in 1974, this area was called Queens Park, but referred to by its longtime name, The Pike. The Pike was once one of the largest boardwalk attractions in the country. It was sadly sold off and demolished by Long Beach in the late 1970s, but on the night of the murder, it was open and it would be just less than a mile away. And it was really large. It had several uh, rides, big roller coasters. It had um, a carousel that was built by, when I looked it up, a, a kind of famous person who was known for making carousels. It sounded amazing. So just in case somebody is listening to this that doesn't necessarily know what a boardwalk is or might not be, because I know I know if you're from where we're from in Northern California, the when we say the boardwalk, we're thinking of the boardwalk in Santa Cruz. And so it's it's kind of connected to a pier. There's usually attractions. It's by the ocean. So it's it's like a um, it's like an outdoor amusement. Well, I mean, all out, amusement parks are outdoor, but it's it's like an amusement park near the ocean. Yeah, and there are a lot of famous boardwalks. I think across the world, really. But yeah, there's uh, Atlantic City has a, a big boardwalk. Well, and Pier Thirty Nine. I always kind of think. I know it's not in San Francisco. It's it's a pier. It's not a boardwalk. But there's a lot of attractions. It's a tourist spot. Yeah, it doesn't really have. I never really think of it having having. Well, I guess it does have a carousel, but it rides carousel, in but a no kind ride. of classical right. boardwalk no rides. sense. This sounded really amazing, and there are some uh, websites and blogs dedicated to pictures and postcards and things from it, and people hoping to maybe someday bring it back. It. It really sounded, I mean, like I said, it was one of the biggest in the nation, and it, it, it sounded pretty amazing, so we'll make sure to have some pictures up for that. On the morning of Tuesday, May 28, 1974, an unknown woman was found murdered on Alamitos Beach. Her body was upside down and fully clothed. She had been raped and strangled. She had been left on the end of the western part of the beach, near a jetty owned by the Villa Riviera and in the surge surf. This means the best I can tell was that her body was at least partially being covered by water coming onto the beach or surging onto the beach. Despite this, police believe she hadn't been deceased long. Before you go on, just to put it in in relation to this, because like you said, this boardwalk is a huge attraction uh, in the area. Where her body was found, how close or in, in what proximity to the boardwalk was that? So the pike is actually about a mile or so from where this happens on the beach. This is also just, I mean, just across the way from the RS Queen Mary. Um, and we will have, um, because it is very interesting how close it is to several, what I would think maybe well-trafficked areas. This is a Tuesday and this supposedly happened, please think, later in the, in the night. But it is interesting to see how close there are things to where this happened, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's so you're saying it's 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 kind of a, a mile away from everything, but it's in the center. It, it's kind of equidistant from a lot of of well trafficked areas, and a mile is not that far. I mean, if if it's conceivable that somebody could have been in the area, and the fact that it was May, late in May, it's almost the start of what I would consider like the tourist season. It's starting to be summer. Families are starting to go on trips. Kids are starting to get out of school. Yeah, and the area is found, it's by a jetty. Uh, that means kind of a a section that goes out into the ocean mm-hmm. made of rocks or concrete. The Villa Riviera, who owns this jetty at the time, is a historic landmark in Long Beach. It was actually opened in 1929. The building is in a Gothic style, and it has things like gargoyles on top of it, and was once originally luxury apartments. And the building itself was at one time the second largest building in Southern California. It has a long and storied history through the years and had amongst its residents admirals and movie stars. In the late 1960s, the building was condemned only to be brought back to life as beautiful condos. And eventually it was given status as a historic landmark. It's still there today. Its address is 800 East Ocean Boulevard and the jetty it owned at the time was just south of the building on Alamito Beach. That jetty is still there as far as I can tell based on maps, but it doesn't say that it currently owns. This is a case that doesn't go to trial, so information into the details of the murder are limited. I tried to find the time and how Jane Doe was found on the beach that morning and wasn't able to do so. And that's despite the newspaper printing daily emergency calls, so calls for police and ambulances, things like that, from the 24-hour period before. So if there was a 911 call, if someone found this person on the beach, or if police found her, whatever happened, that didn't make it into the, the newspaper. 
And police never say how the body is found, so we don't have that information. That's interesting because so oftentimes we've talked about how how just reading the newspaper has helped get a lot of details and, and seeing how those details sometimes get repeated in different ways. You know, it's like that game of telephone. You read it first in the newspaper, and then over time that report gets changed because it gets re-repeated. But in this case, really is, we have no no information. Yeah, I think in a lot of the cases we've covered, there's been, I mean, un, especially in unsolved cases, kind of a gap in the amount of information mm-hmm. we're able to get a hold of. This is one of those stories that doesn't have a lot of newspaper reports over the years, so there isn't as much information, and there's never a trial, so we never get that information. Do you think that, that is partially, because I've seen you work on this case, I, I know a little bit about it, but do you think that that lack of information is the fact that they they didn't know her identity at the time, or do you think that that was more of a... The police, like we've seen in other cases where the police hold a lot of that back because they're looking for, they don't want it, they don't want the, the information to get out because it could spoil the investigation. Yeah, I think in this case, there's limited information because they don't know who the person is. And there's also limited information because they're not led to things right away. They don't have a lot of leads to go on. Mm-hmm. And the case, unfortunately, pretty much it dies off for several for many, many years, actually. Um, and that's not to say someone doesn't look in on it or, you know, there are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. But for the most part, this isn't covered by newspapers. And the truth is, I think we've learned that the majority of murder cases aren't covered by newspapers, mm-hmm. not in the same way that some of the more famous ones are. I think sometimes that's the 24-hour news cycle. And we've talked a lot about that. I think we'll probably always continue to talk about that, is that not understanding why some cases are picked up and others, and whether it's the public's attention that gets it and gets a hold of it, or whether it's somebody writing a story who happens to sympathize with the victim, or or, and we know in some cases it's the victim's family, you know, leading that yeah. charge to make sure that they're in, but... Yeah, and that's something you don't have here because we don't know who this person right, is. So exactly. there's not someone to interview. There's not someone to to keep those fires going. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people, police, um, organizations we're going to talk about a little bit, who do a lot of really hard work to help people who who's who we don't know who they are exactly, right. but who suffer terrible things. I also try to think of who would be on the who would be on the beach in the morning, just kind of looking around to see if I could find anybody who would have mm-hmm. more information. Surfers came to mind, but unlike a lot of beaches around the state, this one has a breakwater installed, and that was installed in the 1940s, and that's a wall out into the ocean. Um, they installed it to protect the area from en- enemy submarines and to support the port. It's long been a controversial issue because it decimated surfing because you don't get waves in the area. And Long Beach hasn't needed that protection from invading forces. So there are a lot of people who'd like to get that that change because Long Beach used to be called the Waikiki of Southern California. Oh, and there are awesome. people who want to bring that surfing back. Yeah. The other people I, I came up with on the beach in the AM are fishermen. Um, and Long Beach is a big area for fishermen. I found out it's really common for people to fish off piers, off jetties, even just on the beach. So that's a possibility, maybe something like that. But in the end, I didn't see anything that that pointed to a direction of how the police were called or how people found out about this. Which seems likely. I mean, it's one of those. It would. Ha- I would think that the fishermen probably would be the best. The best bet to f- who found her. It's just interesting that they didn't report a, a, a police phone call. And this is this area. I'll put up pictures of it then, as if I can find some more then. Um, I also put up a map that includes now. This area is very different than it was at the time that this happened. There are now volleyball pits basically in the exact area where this happened. Um, there's a marina right near there that was not there before. It wasn't there in the 70s when this happened. So it's not as, as much as there are tourist things around the area, this specific area might not have been as as traveled or as common for people to be there. Well, again, as you as said, a it's um, about a mile away from the pike, and then it's on a jetty away. From, she was found on a jetty away from a luxury, you know, the luxury condo. So again, it's a long stretch of beach in the early morning hours. And again, how right. how long she'd been there, nobody could tell. Of course, one of the first steps in any investigation, especially when so often people are murdered by those they know, is to determine the identity of the victim. But the woman they found on the beach didn't have anything on or near her that gave any clues to her identification. There was no purse, no wallet, and nothing else to even pinpoint where she had been or who she had been with before her violent death. 
Not knowing this information immediately impacted the investigation. The only information detectives had about the victim was the description. Jane Doe, number 40, was believed to be in her late teens to early 20s. Lots of sites will put her between 20 and 30, for instance. She was 5 feet 2 inches tall and 100 to 130 pounds. Her hair was long, straight, and black or dark brown. She had brown eyes and a burn scar about the size of a dime on the back of her left hand. This scar was also in the shape of a T. I will have links on our website at CaliforniaTrueCrime.com under the page for Jane Doe number 40 to the Doe Network where you, you can view reconstructions of her face as well as pictures from the victim and the items she had on her when she was found. Police were unsure what her race or ethnicity was. In articles, she's described as white, as Hispanic or Latino, but without knowing more about her, it was impossible to narrow down. Jane Doe was also described by police as looking as if she was healthy, and this was important for many reasons. Long Beach, as we said, it's a city connected to a lot of other places in California. It's not far from Los Angeles. It's just a couple of hours from the California-Mexican border. Also, L.A. County in the 1960s and 70s was experiencing, like a lot of places in California and around the country, a lot of people traveling in and out. Uh, For obvious reasons, that makes making guesses about Jane Doe based on how she looks a little more difficult. We also talk, we've talked a lot about the amount of hitchhiking and, you know, especially in the late 60s and early 70s. And so this would be kind of place her right in the middle of that huge influx of young people that are not only moving up and down California, but also in and out of California. So without more, you know, better, perfect information, they have to use what they had. To detectives, it appeared that Jane Doe was healthy and cared for. Police believed that someone in the world would be missing or looking for her. So for better or worse, as a description, she didn't look as expected for someone who was transient or homeless. When she was found, Jane Doe was wearing a two-piece pink or peach suit with white strings tied in front. It's described most often as a capri suit, meaning that the pants end at the ankle or a bit higher. There are lots of ads for this type of pantsuit at the time. She also had on an imitation black fur coat with bronze buttons and black calf length suede boots. On her hand, she was wearing a 14, they described it as a 14 karat white gold engagement ring with a small solitaire diamond. I don't know why they use the term engagement ring. Um, it's probably just what it looked like at the time, but it just kind of looks like a, uh, just a little ring. She wearing, did it say what hand she's it wearing? It did not on? say what oh, hand. So I don't maybe they, think it said, but I'll. Maybe they, maybe they default to that if it's worn on the left hand. I mean, it certainly could have been a ring for that, right. but it also could have been an heirloom or something passed right, down right, right, or something right. someone bought themselves. In her pocket, she had two keys. Police theorized one looked like a possible house key, and the other one was much smaller, like, like one you would use in a padlock. Mm. The key ring the two keys were on was broken. Before you go on, the, the question about what she's wearing. So, so this is May, and May in Southern California at this time of year, even near the ocean, is pretty warm, right? The temperature, I'm just going to go over that, actually. The temperature hit 61 degrees at 11 p.m. the night before she was murdered with a small wind of eight miles per hour. And they're also, she's found on the beach. So we don't know where she was prior to this, but it would have been a little bit on the cooler side at the time. Okay, because the the imitation fur coat threw me in, the in, in, you know, I just don't think I like wearing jackets near. But if it was colder, so chances are she was close by. The other thing about imitation fur is often not as warm as say fur. So, mm. you know, 60 degrees is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I would think the weather made sense to me for what she was wearing. So with so little information about the crime and the name of the victim, police decided to go door to door in the area to see if anyone saw anything, anyone knew anything, and if anyone had seen her maybe in their establishment. Police began searching door to door on Broadway Street in Long Beach. This area has a flourishing nightlife, both at the time and now, and is a street full of bars, restaurants, and nightclubs. It's also a thriving area for gay culture and hosts one of the largest gay pride parades in the country. This area was a little less than a mile from where Jane Doe was found. Details of what the police found in this search is unknown, but it appears that on the night before she was found, Jane Doe was possibly seen in a bar along Broadway Street. Police also looked through missing persons records, Surely someone had reported her missing, and although police would continue to monitor reports from around the country of missing women, they would be unable to find one match that matched definitively to their Jane Doe. 
Undeterred, on June 1, 1974, in an article titled, Police Seek Help in Identifying Body, in the Independent Press Telegram, the police made a plea to anyone who might know who she was and for the first time labeled the victim on the beach, Jane Doe No. 40. Like so many pleas for information we've seen in other cases, this just didn't yield the results they needed. Without Jane Doe No. 40's name, or any clues to who she might be, police were at a loss. Something that should be impossible. In a world filled with people, a woman had her life taken by an unknown murderer in an unknown circumstances, and this act not only took that life, but somehow also erased her existence. There were many obstacles to this case. The unknown victim, a lack of witnesses, a busy and big city filled not just with residents, but people coming in from the Mexican-California border, people moving through the naval shipyard and the port of Long Beach, one of the busiest ports in the nation, and not to mention Long Beach's ties to the rest of L.A. County. Unlike a lot of similar cases covered in the true crime space, Jane Doe No. 40's story didn't get a lot of attention from local newspapers. While there were other stories in the newspaper that may have taken precedence, like the Symbionese Liberation Army and Patty Hearst, or the ensuing case of Watergate and the Nixon tapes that would lead to President Nixon's resignation on August of 1974, or that without details and the pleas of loved ones, it was harder to gain interest in her story. Either way, there was limited information about Jane Doe No. 40 and very limited coverage. Despite knowing how Jane Doe was murdered, they didn't know how her body had come to be on the beach, or what she was doing in her last hours, or if they did, it wasn't reported. Quickly after her discovery, the trail of clues leading to both her murderer and her identity became cold. Like so many cases in the United States, when leads in her case stopped coming in, the case was put on a shelf while detectives moved on to other crimes. It sounds harsh for detectives to set aside one case to focus on newer ones, but budget constraints and a lack of evidence mean that there are only so many resources to go around. Newer cases have the best chance for being solved, so investigators continue their work, but often don't forget past crimes. In the 1970s, techniques for solving crimes and identifying bodies using DNA did not exist. In fact, future science may have solved this quickly, or at least given detectives more options than trying to track the path of a nameless murder victim. DNA, however, was yet to come, And even sadder, it wasn't an expected science that the detectives in Long Beach could prepare for. We've covered at least one case and know from news stories about cold cases that many murders that occurred during this time period do have ample evidence stored so that DNA can be taken years later. And while that's amazing, it's important to remember that many cases will not have this capability. And unfortunately for Jane Doe number 40, that's true here. In all of my research of this case, I did not see any evidence that police had DNA to test. Part of that is she's found in the ocean, right? I mean, she's found, she's found off a jetty. So I, she's found at least partially in the ocean. I can't tell you how, right. I mean, how much or anything like that. There's a lot, there's, there's gaping holes in that, in, in what they're reporting. But, you know, I think again, we've talked about it a lot. So, but it bears repeating, you know, is that idea of CSI and television and movies, has really, I think, skewed us into thinking what what evidence is available to police, you know, in 2021. But also thinking back, like you said, if, if these police aren't, they don't even, you know, they're not thinking about DNA. It's not on their radar. It's not, like you said, not an expected science. Like, oh, it'll be here next year. Let's collect this. And if without without even the most basic thing of her identity, you know, collecting more evidence would be, is got to be a tough, tough thing to do. Yeah. And I think like you're suggesting perhaps the ocean might've washed away a certain amount of evidence of what happened to her or who had done it. But I mean, having her body would have now, you know, you might've been able to run her own DNA and test that, find out who she was, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously we still find people, we don't know who they are and it's not you know, perfect and right. she may not be in a system or anything like that, but the amount of tools that we have now versus sure. 1974 are legions. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you, though, I do have a question. You mentioned you, you, you talk about her, her being killed the mode. Do, do they, do they go into at any time like how she was killed? Just that she was strangled. And you mentioned that she was, she was, uh, uh, raped. Right. 
there's so there's obviously no semen evidence off of that or do they do they go over that later they never say what that evidence is or how they know that she was raped so i'm not sure if there was physical evidence or what kind of physical evidence yeah or how they knew the evidence locker is a weekly podcast about international true crime made by hardcore true crime fans It's somewhat grungy. Join us as we explore the dark corners of the globe. We've covered cases from Sweden, Brazil, Australia, and the U.S., to mention a few. Find us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. While it wasn't reported what happened to Jane Doe's body after she was found, the process at the time in Long Beach for both Jane and John Doe's, as well as for deceased, unclaimed, and unidentified bodies, was to perform an autopsy, take as much evidence as possible, and then cremate the bodies. Once a year, the cremated bodies would be mixed together and put in a common grave with a marking designating the year. A solemn service would be held for the bodies of those unknown and forgotten, attended by dignitaries in the area and performed by a chaplain and then the bodies would be laid to rest. This means Jane Doe, number 40, was most likely laid to rest in Los Angeles County Cemetery, next to a placard with the year 1974. Her ashes mixed with other Jane and John Doe's, as well as people who were known but unclaimed. Something that happens far too often when a person passes away and doesn't have remaining family or friends to claim their bodies. In 2015, for instance, there were 1,300 people who were mainly left unclaimed with a handful unknown put to rest the same way in this county. Less than 20 years after Jane Doe No. 40 was murdered, science would give investigators one of the biggest leaps forward in crime solving with the introduction of DNA testing. With these new methods came new changes in Long Beach. One of the changes were procedures regarding Jane and John Doe's. Long Beach now holds the bodies of these victims for several years before cremation with the goal of identifying each victim, as well as solving their murders. Of course, how evidence is collected has changed as well. But during those 20 years, Jane Doe No. 40's case went very cold, with no one working on it officially for years. Long Beach, like many places across California and the country, didn't have the money to keep a cold case unit of detectives working on older cases that still needed to be solved. Then in 2009, Long Beach was awarded a very important grant, one that would change the fate of many of their cold cases. The National Institute of Justice, an agency that's part of the United States Department of Justice, awarded Long Beach with a grant to specifically establish a cold case unit whose purpose would be to review cold cases that existed before the 1990s, cases that didn't have the benefit of DNA evidence. Their goal would be to review the backlog of cases with the hope that they could find DNA evidence to submit and finally bring closure to victims and their families. So this, so this, this group, their sole purpose is only cases per, pre-1990, and they're, they're not necessarily investigating, but they're reviewing the cases that potentially could have more evidence through DNA. Yeah, the goal is to find those cases that existed prior to DNA evidence, to our knowledge of it, and now run DNA in them. As long as there, I mean, obviously, as long as you had something to test. I mean, if there's nothing there, there would be no point. So that, I guess that would be the it's, the litmus test for them is a case A has it's it's over it's over the time limit. That's great, but it has no no testable material versus B same. But in this case, we have a shirt that's never that's still an evidence locker. Right. Doesn't mean there's a DNA on it or or viable DNA, but it does mean that that's a better opportunity for us to test. Yeah, your goal is to try and find. Right. The, you know, the ability to develop that DNA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Using this grant, Long Beach hired two retired detectives to go back through the cases. Although the grant had limits, such as only paying for those uh, detectives to work two days a week or a total of 960 hours a year. So that time that they're working is invaluable. The detectives at the time were Brian McMahon and Mike Dugan, and they were the first cold case detectives in Long Beach. Not only was time and money limited by the grant, but under the auspices of the program, as you're saying, Charles, only cases with usable DNA could be reopened. 
This grant and the work done by the detectives proved to be very successful. By 2017, 90 cases were reopened and the detectives were able to submit DNA evidence to the FBI's DNA database known as CODIS. That's 90 cases which had previously sat on a shelf because leads have in them had stopped. Another sure sign of the importance of funding the work of cold case detectives was that under this grant, the clearance rate for Long Beach's cases increased. According to the newspaper, the Orange County Register, in 2012, the clearance rate for murder cases in Long Beach jumped from 50 to 63%, in great part because of this cold case unit. They made 11 arrests, closed six cases by finding out the suspect in the case was deceased, and in 14 other cases, they developed a suspect and are still working to build a case. That's amazing. And based on the work of two people, just that, I mean, I'm, I'm not downplaying but that, that, that cost, because that, but two retired detectives, not even working full time, two days a week, were able to increase it by 13% their, their close rate. That is amazing to think about, to not, not, not to get on a soapbox, but to think about if even one of those people were given to some of these departments that we've talked about where some of these cases have languished because they don't have the resources. I mean, well, I know we read a lot about it in our newspaper archives and our research, and, and I know most of us that watch the news or, you know, when something bad happens or, or you, you, they do those retrospectives on local news is, you know, it's been five or sometimes ten years after a case. But to have somebody dedicated just to even finding out if there's a possibility. and I also find it interesting that these guys' main job was triage. You know, like their first job was to separate, to categorize those things and then carry it through. I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, being in the true crime space and talking about a lot of these things, we've seen over and over, we've talked about the work of detectives in a lot of the cases that we've talked about. You know, and you hear a lot of stories about detectives you know, when they're off their shift, still looking through older mm-hmm. cases. And I know a lot of these cases still get looked at, even though, it, you know, it seems like they're long. There's, you know, not as many leads anymore, things going on. And I know they work so hard. And that's always kind of bothered me a little bit as a, as a good news story, both because I think being a detective has to be very difficult. The things that you see and experience and your time off is important for your mental health, but also because, you know, budgets are really representative of who we are as a society. And this obviously very much matters. And paying someone to do it as a job is a signifier that we're saying, yes, this matters. This is something we should do and be dedicated to. So, And we're going to show our value by that, by funding it. So as much as I like celebrating police who are doing things in their off hours, and I think that that's amazing, it's I'd terrib- like to celebrate, you know, us paying for these things paying them paying for a job that we all understand is important i also think that that something that I, I, and maybe it is and i'm not seeing it i hope it is but like i said i don't often see it that when these cases get solved and rightly so a, a good chunk of that credit goes to the the men and women that are doing this cold case case research but they wouldn't be able to do this unless the original detectives and those detectives that have worked tirelessly over the years to collect that, preserve that evidence, keep some of these cases alive, keep the memories of these victims if they're not here, or keep keep communicating with these victims if they didn't do their job. And I think sometimes, and I, I know, you know, in the last few years, we've had quite a few high profile cases that come through and got celebrated, and it was really amazing that they were solved and that the families of the victims and the victims themselves got some closure. But I think it's also important to remember that, that that work is not done by a individual. It's done by a group of individuals all working in a team. And I think that that needs to be celebrated as well. And that will actually come up here actually pretty quickly. So uh, unfortunately in 2012, despite all of the successes, money from that grant ran out. But Long Beach, realizing how important that endeavor had been, was able to find more grant funding and continue on. While detectives were able to find many successes with the grant program, when they gathered the evidence in the Jane Doe No. 40 case, what they found was disheartening. Unlike several of their other cases, they didn't have any DNA evidence, as we discussed. And since her body had most likely been cremated years before, finding DNA would be impossible. 
And yet, when detectives opened the case, they saw the pictures of a young Jane Doe and read the story of a woman just beginning her life, who no one seemed to be looking for, and they felt it necessary to follow any and all leads to solve this case and find out who she was. The problem was that this cold case team was specifically funded by that grant, meant to open cases where only DNA could be used. Under the grant, it meant that the detectives could not spend time investigating this murder. It just didn't qualify. That didn't sit well with them. They felt compelled to find another way to keep this case open. So they went and talked to detectives working on current open cases and had Jane Doan's case reassigned 30 plus years later as an open case. The case was reassigned to detectives Todd Johnson and Malcolm Evans. Using traditional detective techniques, the kind that often get overshadowed in the media by DNA, but have solved many of the crimes we've covered, they were led to a possible witness the night Jane Doe number 40 was murdered. And it's difficult to tell, as I said, because there's not a trial, so you're not getting a kind of play-by-play how this happened. But it appears that this witness came from the files and during the initial investigation. So this is somebody they're kind of led to or... uh, I think a location or people they're led to based on, as you were saying, someone else writing this information down. It may not have seemed important at the time, or it may not have helped at the time, but all these years later, these names, these areas, they, they really matter to continuing to find out what happened. This is such a bizarre uh, for me. And it may be inappropriate at this point, but one of my all time favorite police movies is hot fuzz. If you've ever seen hot fuzz, You know what I'm talking about. If not, I highly recommend it. Um, The moment when Sergeant Angel talks about the most important part of the police equipment is his notepad that he writes down notes. And that always sticks with me because how many times is it one piece of evidence, something somebody writes down somewhere, you know, that, that causes it. And again, 30 years later. The witness is now living in Texas. And in 2013, 39 years after Jane Doe number 40 was murdered, detectives traveled to talk with him. The witness's name is never given to the public, and charges against him are, to our knowledge, never filed. But this witness turned out to be powerful. Not only did he see Jane Doe number 40 the night she was murdered, he told detectives he helped dispose of her body on Alamitos Beach. Witnesses coming forward years after seeing a crime or even taking part in a crime is something we've talked a lot about. We, it's something we've, we've hoped people still do in the cases we've covered that are unsolved. But obviously that's something that can break cases. What makes someone come forward or finally share what they know is different in every case. At the time of a crime, witnesses can feel pressure in the form of fear or even loyal to a friend or a loved one. Sometimes time can just break down those feelings. In other cases, over time, the fear of going to jail may be unable to compete with feelings of guilt that eat away at a witness or participant. Whatever it is, in cases like this, that time can mean everything. When police talked with a witness in Texas, he not only told them what he knew of that night and how he participated in the crime, he told them the name of the man who had murdered Jane Doe. The witness told police that the man who murdered Jane Doe was Gary Stamp. Stamp was a longtime resident of Long Beach, California, and a man still living in the city in 2013. Stamp is 61 years old at the time, and when police brought him in for an interview, he did something that would probably surprise a lot of people. At some point, he tells the truth, or at least his version of it. In 1974, when the crime occurred, Stamp was about 22 years old. On that May night, he said he believed he met Jane Doe in a bar in Long Beach. He also said that he thought her name may have been Anna, but he didn't totally remember. He also admitted both to raping and strangling Jane Doe number 40. With the help of the unnamed witness, the two left her body on Alamitos Beach. Stamp, however, didn't remember anything else that would be helpful to police in determining her identity. And what he did remember, he couldn't be sure of. According to Stamp, he did not know Jane Doe number 40 prior to the night of her murder. Police arrest Gary Stamp and charge him with murder. After 39 years of not knowing what had happened to Jane Doe, the police had finally more information. A man they could hold responsible. But they still didn't know who she was. And in an unfortunate twist, Gary Stamp was also in a losing battle with cancer. On June 14, 2013, Gary Stamp was in Judge James Otto's courtroom for arraignment on the charges of murder, and he pled not guilty. He pled not guilty after he confessed to the police? Yes. And we don't know exactly what his defense would have been 
because unfortunately, while awaiting trial, Gary Stamp died in custody on January of 2014 of cancer. Without a trial, information is limited about what happened to Jane Doe number 40. In 2013, detectives worked with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to create an artist's rendering of Jane Doe, who is sometimes now called Anna Doe. It was released to the public, and I'll put links, as we said, I think earlier, of this rendering on our website and social media in the hope that someone can identify this victim. I will also have links on our site to the Doe Network. This is an organization that works hard to help identify victims around the world and to bring awareness to these cases, and it's an invaluable source. I am absolutely flabbergasted for a few reasons. One, the fact that after 39 years, uh, a witness in Texas is, is the linchpin to this whole thing. That in itself is amazing and, and a testament to the, the amazing police work of the Long Beach Police Department. To think that they pull Stamp in and question him, and he admits to it, when they have no physical evidence, really, or I mean, at least, at least in what we've heard, there's no physical evidence, but he cops to it after all that time. And then the complete callousness, which it shouldn't surprise me, given what we've, what we've researched and talked about, and as, as members of the true crime community have listened and read in our own our own lives but the absolute callousness that he murdered this woman and has no idea what who she was that it's just some random happenstance encounter at a bar some some evening in may yeah i think the fact that he remembers so little about it and perhaps more would have come out with a trial or more details but i i don't even it's mind boggling that that event is so little in your life that they're so you're just like maybe that was someone's name maybe this was the place it just and then when when the answer is there when when the police have have done this have worked this way have have the, they themselves sacrificed their own you know to get to this point then to have that justice snatched from them because he dies of cancer i think that's just that's as tragic as well i won't say it's as tragic it's not it's nowhere near as tragic but it's unsatisfying that he doesn't pay for it and and not that you not it's not scales i understand that you can't balance those that way well i think that's the hard truth is we do talk a lot about of our cases about at least finding information or holding someone accountable as that as that matters and and it does matter i don't know that it's always mattered as much as we may have thought for families you know you still you still have to live without your loved one and I don't think it br- it brings as much closure or I, I don't know whatever that feeling is where you can move on or move forward as we would like. I don't think that it does. I've been reading a lot about that for families that it that it just you know trials and stuff there they're added stress and that it doesn't really bring you that sense of closure justice that right. we're looking for. Well, I think it's a trap for us, and I'll I'll put myself I I will won't speak for all of us, but I will speak for me. It's a trap, and I think that's the allure for me uh, of some of these stories, is that as much as in my head I know that this, there are real people, real people connected to these, and that they have lives, and they have families, and these tragic stories, and, and not understanding what these people have went through or, or endured, both the survivors and the victims' families that of those victims that didn't survive. But oftentimes we do hear them of, you know, of the stories of their lives and then this terrible occurrence, but the quote unquote good guys come in and the investigators work tirelessly and they, they do their job. And, you know, because of a slip or a a witness or a, a uncovered piece of evidence or whatever, they're able to bring this person or these people to justice. And in my little compartmentalized world where that's the ending they had they got justice right. and and I know we've talked about this a lot and as you said earlier we we're speaking to the choir because if you listen to this more than just this episode you know kind of how we feel about this but it's it's so much more than that and I think a lot of times this is this story specifically and I was really happy that you asked me to be on it with you is because it's this illustrates that this terrible feeling of unfulfillment and just senselessness of it that this person doesn't have a name she did 
and a family and loved ones, but now she's known as Jane Doe 40 forever and a, a, a plot in, in L.A. that's marked simply by the, by the year, 1974. Yeah, and they're still looking for who she is, for anyone who, you know, who might know her or recognize her. We will link to all of those things because it still matters, but it does feel a little emptier, this story. It's been 45 years since Jane Doe number 40 was found murdered in Alamitos Beach. Researching this episode was difficult, as I can tell you very little about her. Due to the hard work of investigators, I can tell you how she was murdered and who murdered her. I can tell you what she was wearing that last night of her life. I can tell you things like the shape of the two keys she had in her pocket, and even the details of the scar on her left hand. But those details far outweigh the things we don't know about her. I don't know how old she was or what she was like as a person. I can't describe the sound of her voice or what she looked like when she laughed or cried. Jane Doe number 40 had a life. She had stories and ideas and, like all of us, hopes and dreams for a future. All of that was taken away when those desires ran into a man who had his own. A man who extinguished not just her life, but her very identity, in an act so callous he barely remembered it. She deserved better. She deserves to be known to be remembered, and she deserves to have her name. If you have any information on Jane Doe number 40, please call Long Beach Homicide Detectives at 562-570-7244. For tonight's cold case, we'll be staying in the area of Long Beach. On the afternoon of July 21st, 2018, at approximately 4.30 p.m. at the Pan American Park in the 5100 block of Centralia Avenue. 57 year old Frederick Taft was shot nine times, three times in the lower body, three times in the back, and once in the head, killing him inside a park restroom. 40 to 50 members of the Taft family had assembled for a family reunion at the time of the shooting. A Long Beach police spokesperson had stated that there is a suspect that is sought for questioning about the shooting and released a sketch to the general public and offering a reward to any information. The suspect is said to be a white man in his 50s. Witnesses have described a man running from the bathroom where Taft was killed, wearing khaki shorts, calf-high socks, and a fishing hat. He was seen carrying a rifle as he ran. Since the description and the sketch were released, Information and progress on the case has almost stopped entirely. Many have stated that this killing was racially motivated, as Taft was black, as were the majority of the family in attendance at the reunion. Witnesses at the event had reported a white man in a Prius driving by and shouting, quote, 187 in the park, the day of the shooting. There was also a report of another group nearby playing softball that had been harassed by a group of white men on bicycles shouting racial slurs. This coupled with the fact that none of Taft's belongings, including a wallet full of cash, were left untouched. Police have stated there is not enough information to point towards a hate crime, but local residents have reported racist actions have been a regular occurrence in this area before and after this shooting. Taft's daughter, Corey, describes her father as a big-hearted person who loved his family, especially his grandchildren. Frederick Taft was a devoted family man who was enjoying time with his family when he was gunned down in public. There as of yet have been no further leads in the case, and information from the Long Beach police is limited. If you or anyone else has information that could help solve the murder of Frederick Taft, contact the Long Beach police homicide detectives at 562-570-7244. Anonymous tips may be submitted through the LA Crime Stoppers by calling 1-800-222-8477. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. If you want to contact us, you can do so by email at calitruecrime at gmail.com or on Twitter and Instagram at calitruecrime. We're on our Facebook page. Uh, If you'd like more information on this or any of our episodes, including where we got our information, you can find it all on our website, californiatruecrime.com. If you appreciate this episode, you can leave us a review on the platform of your choice or by joining our Patreon, which you can find on our website. 
Special thanks go out to Melanie Duncan, our technical advisor. This has been a co-production of Snail Ranch Studios and Waygrimace.